Okay. How many of you here know someone or know some of someone who's had an eating disorder, a diagnosed? Well, y'all know me, so now you know someone. Um, I am no longer have this and will never have it again. Um, so, uh, and I've spent the last 15 years coaching people who have suffered from eating disorders for somewhere in between a couple years to 50 years of their life. The oldest client I worked with was 80. She suffered from bulimia for over 50 years. Her teeth had all fallen out. Her esophagus had eroded and she was actually dying because of that esophagus problem. And it's very understandable why scientists would assume this is something that is like an addiction. Because that's what it feels like. It felt like that to me. Um, however, can it, it, it really isn't an addiction if you're trying to survive, if it's a survival mechanism. That predisposes every single one of us here to having one under the right circumstances. So none of you are immune if given the opportunity to have circumstances kind of coalesce, right? Because it's not just one thing that an eating disorder is. Um, so if you yourself have an eating disorder, this might be triggering. My suggestion would be to separate yourself from the conversation and listen as if it's someone else, not you, okay? Um, and you might get through this and be like, wow, this was really helpful. This wasn't triggering at all. It actually came to bring me to some sense of compassion for myself and that I'm not crazy because that's what it feels like. It feels like you are freaking crazy and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so this is an important process here because as we've learned with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is based in, you know, evolutionary, you know, evolutionary psychology, how we evolved to survive living, especially in the wilderness, not living in a world of plenty, right? If you look at human history, it wasn't necessarily based in ex excess. And if there was excess, there wasn't excess long enough, right? So humans have primarily evolved in not excess. We've learned to survive in the wilderness. We learned to survive by foraging, hunting, sharing, community. And community has become something really important to our survival. And um, as I've discussed over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, this can become really big when someone is insufficient in their own mind to secure themselves, right? If you don't feel capable of surviving alone, you're going to have an increased need for belonging. So what happens is if you have internalized shame, internalized belief that you are inherently unworthy, that you have nothing, that there is nothing that gives you a sense of worthiness, what happens is there's an increase in the importance of external validation. So as, if you don't internally feel good about yourself, the need for external validation is gonna go up. Doesn't that make sense? Could because of the fact that our need for these to become highly, highly attached to love and belonging. So this is why it feels like when you're disproved of or get in trouble or are caught doing something wrong, you're in serious fight or flight. Evolutionary wise, it has everything to do with the fact that this provides you these two, right? So if your belief within yourself is that you have done, you are bad, you are wrong, you suck, that you don't have what it takes, that you are inherently inadequate, the mind is going to say, well, what can you do to fulfill that? And Again, if there isn't an internal sense of self that has value, you're going to look for an external sense of self that is seen as valuable. You're going to look for that approval and validation outside of yourself. 
So you become highly attracted to predictable and defined belief systems. It becomes very attractive when there are rules and regulations that are more black and white because it's predictable. I can follow these rules and I'm good at that. That means then I'll be more valuable. So people who have this underlying problem tend to be highly attractive to very strict and strong rules and communities because it, it's easy to follow. If there's gray, it's not predictable, that feels, that just promotes someone's internal sense of shame. Did that make sense? So if you're insecure, seeking external approval, communities that are open-minded and have a lot of gray aren't gonna be very attractive because it's just going to kind of promote you feeling inadequate anyways. So if you find a community that has very strong authoritarian styles, and this has been studied, that's gonna be really attractive. It's gonna feel safer than a gray, wishy-washy community that's more open-minded. You're gonna want something black and white. It fulfills more of a survival need. Does that make sense? You have this increased need and attachment to the belief system. Once you find something that is highly controlling, definable, clear, your mind starts to simulate that hedonic area of the brain becomes attractive. I like it, it feels good. Not having rules, why would then, then you're, you're gonna fall, you're gonna fail. If you don't have rules, you're going to be sucky. That's the mindset of someone who has that up there. Without rules and regulations, what's gonna motivate you to be a better person? Because you need external rules and regulations to be a better person. That's how that works. That's a survival mechanism. It's understandable to feel this way when you don't really have a clear sense of worth within yourself or is internal sense of capacity. The illusion is without rules and regulations, your suckiness will come forth. So when someone says that, they're really projecting out their internal sense of unworthiness. How am I to feel worthy without rules? Therefore, everybody else needs rules to be worthy. That's that narcissistic idea of superiority. Then there's an increase in radicalism, extremism, perfectionism. The more intense, the more intense this becomes. Is this making sense? Because some people can have an uh, less, they might feel inadequate. They might feel insecure within themselves, but maybe it's not as intense. They might not need to be so controlled or need so much control over their environment. So it's not always black and white, but this is kind of the direction it heads because what happens is this becomes more and more important. So it is in essence, this becomes a wider and bigger need. To the point where these become less important to the mind, because if you have this, then this is taken care of. So in a way, this can become an upside down pyramid for someone who is narcissistic, living in a narcissistic community, codependent with that community, codependent with that identity. You become more radicalized, more perfectionistic, which means there's less gray. It's more all or nothing. It's more extreme, seeking the extremes and thinking that those extremes are actually beneficial, right? But what it's benefiting is that, but it's superficial. It's not coming from the inside. This is very common. And what they've been studying over the last decade is the conversation around um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Is there something called complex PTSD that's more relational? It's not necessarily one intense, extreme experience, right? Like watching someone get murdered, right? Or being traumatized by uh, getting in a car accident, right? Or watching someone get shot or shooting someone. That's a, that is something that we can contextualize and actually see under context. Complex PTSD is small, smaller types of trauma, usually based in a, a abandonment, rejection, disapproval, being shamed, being shunned, 
right? Because of that third hierarchy of need over long periods of time. So it's small bouts of trauma over periods of time. They have seen this commonly in families where there's narcissistic abuse. Again, authoritarian style of supremacy. You have to be superior. If you're not, you're a piece of shit. Look at your siblings, they're better than you. Why can't you be like them? Or look at you, you're amazing. You're my narcissistic supply. You other children suck. You need to do all the work. You know, when you're raised in this kind of abusive environment psychologically, you don't get to eat because you're too fat. That can be traumatic over long periods of time because someone's hijacking your first hierarchy of need and saying, you can't eat unless you do what I say. That's Stockholm syndrome, right? So prisoners of war, sex traffickers, cult members. They've seen this in more radicalized religions and cults that are more um, isolating where you're not allowed to um, hang out with other religions or be with other religions or have a community with anybody other than our own. It's like being held hostage and having Stockholm syndrome. Um, another thing they studied is when someone is forced to do something they don't want to, it can create a soul death. That's what they call it. Where your sense of who you were prior can never exist again because you are permanently transformed by the trauma. Being made to harm or kill someone can do that. So what happens is you're trying to find a sense of safety outside of your true self because the true self has been in danger and traumatized. So this is an important thing because the more intense the trauma over long periods of time, the more likely you are to gravitate to authoritarian styles of politics, <clears throat> government, religion. This has been studied by the government actually because they were looking at what happens when people have trauma, even just regular PTSD from war, from some horrible event. If they don't get any help, the mind is trying to find a space of safety and prediction and control feels safe. If we can control this environment, if we can control our surroundings, if I can control my family, if I can control my beliefs, it gives me something that will inspire me to feel better right? At least I'm working hard to get better. So with that said, it doesn't have to be a community. It can just be a body image, which is also another thing they found. Body image, we're going back to this, requires an internalized, that means you took it in as fact and truth, that this body image is superior, right? This body usually resembles, or it what it symbolizes is praise. It symbolizes being seen as valuable, being seen as attractive. The more you see that image, the more your brain stimulates that hedonic pleasure center of the brain. That's why it becomes attractive. Oh my God, I love your, you know, Lululemon. So it's because you've seen it enough associated with positivity that it's actually stimulating the inclusion or belonging side of our survival. Oh my God, I love your jacked up truck. It's really amazing. You're hot, right? That's a, something that's been associated with a community that might give you someone a sense of inclusion and worthiness. So body image, think of it as a superficial idea of being able to say, hey, I'm worthy. You can see it. So that is external. So what's confusing with body image is that once someone has internalized an image, they think it is their, their personal attraction. They don't see that I'm attracted to the inclusion from what is seen as valuable to my community. Does that make sense? That's the hard part with internalization of body images is you feel attraction to it, but you're not maybe recognizing that that attraction is actually an attraction to being seen as valuable. That's where it's coming from. That's where the pleasure, the, the idea that something is, um, it just comes in constructs. It's coming through um, belief systems. Again, this is part of survival. If you don't feel worthy of inclusion, within your own character or self, you might want to blend in physically so that your 
exclusive or your exclusion, the, the feelings of being worthy of exclusion can be hidden. And you're hiding to hide a facade. And this can also be belief systems. So in essence, body image, especially body images that require starvation, or let's just say people were saying, in order to be cool, you have to sleep less. People who sleep less have more self-control. People who sleep less are superior. Imagine what would happen to those of us who fall asleep too soon, sleep in, feel the urge to nap. We would have shame associated to that. We would want to hide those things. We would internalize ourselves as being bad. We might go in and say, hey, can, uh, maybe do I have a disorder? Oh, oh my gosh, you sleep like eight hours, you piece of shit. Maybe you should take a pill that keeps you awake. You need more coffee. Do you see how ridiculous that sounds? Sounds pretty freaking ridiculous, right? So in a community that over the past century, because we went over, how does this begin? I think what, four lectures ago, we talked about body image and history, how it works. We've really started to worship uh, at ultra leanness. It's not just being normal, it's ultra leanness that requires starvation for the majority of people who, who meet that standard. In that case, you have competition between the more important hierarchy of need and this need. In essence, this one becomes bigger, right? The body image you're seeking to fulfill here is not threatening a biological, physiological need. This isn't required, but this one is. But this one is holding this one hostage. Again, I'm gonna repeat the word Stockholm syndrome. I don't know if you know what that is. It's when someone's held hostage. Usually the person holding the person hostage threatens food, water, shelter, safety. And then the person who's being held hostage starts to have feelings of affection for their captor. They've seen this in communities, cults, they see it all the time. And in essence, you're being held hostage by your body image. Your sense of safety comes from restricting your food. That does not mean that all of those hardwired evolutionary triggers to feast before famine, to hoard, to hide, to keep, to secure, to get safe with your food doesn't still exist. So now we've got bio biological competition and mismatch. Internal unworthiness and shame, as that increases, an increased desire to control worthiness externally, attraction to extreme body images that show worth or safety can go up, Attraction to, um, to the means and the end. So now you become attracted to the dieting, the means. I am super excited about diet, being a dietitian. I remember when I was in this state of mind, this is when I was like, I'm gonna be a fitness guru because everybody needs to be lean and hot and healthy, healthy, right? I thought health was a look because that's what I saw. Then there's an increase in perfectionism because you need this more intensely there's no lenience or grace. There's no lenience. There's no self-compassion because you have to meet these higher standards for a concept of the body image. So that increase in perfectionism ultimately conflicts with reality. And reality then seems and feels like danger. I remember going, oh, I remember going out to dinner with my now husband who I was just newly dating. And having to hide, I was, first of all, super controlling about what I was ordering, you know, talking to the waitress about every single thing that needed to be controlled. Um, because I was trying to protect myself from feeling the vulnerability of the danger of food. It was unhealthy, too many calories. I was trying to restrict because that's what you got to do to be healthy, right? not realizing that what it was doing to my brain was super, super dangerous. That biological, psychological response is quite dangerous, right? But oh no, being thin, thin was healthy, right? So, and then once I started eating, he had French fries and man, did I want some French fries. So I started to negotiate. You know what? I already worked out today. I did I think I burned over 2000 calories in total. I should be able to eat more than 1200. I'll just have a couple fries. <clears throat> I couldn't stop. I ate the whole thing. 
then had this massive panic, like terror, terror, because I felt I already believed I had failed. There was no hope I might as well. I'm just going to go ahead and puke this up. So I had predetermined I was going to puke, which made the binge really big. Then I started drinking. So I just blamed all the puking on being drunk. I did that multiple times. No one thought I had an issue. No one knew because it was really kind of normal. I was just really healthy. But then I would start drinking. Then I would start eating. I had already chosen to puke it up or exercise. So when the puking got bad, I started exercising more. That changed the binging. Because you, when you binge that way, when you know you're going to exercise purge without puking purge, you got to be within the range that you can handle the burning of the calories, right? So it really changes how you binge. Talk to anybody in a binge eating disorder, they do the same thing. How long is it going to be until you start your next diet? Well, that changes how much you binge. So if you're going to start your diet tomorrow, you're going to binge a lot more. If you're going to start your diet a month, it becomes a more long, drawn out, consistent overeating, not necessarily the same binge eating. So with perfectionism comes immediate failure, ruined, failure, shame. And it, again, it comes kind of comes back to the beginning of wh where this starts. Internal unworthiness and shame. And this just presents it because you're no longer chasing your addiction to inclusion and worthiness that's been attached to a body image. Any questions here? I, have, I could keep on going around how many times I, then I would, I, how many often I hit my binges. So this is kind of a great representation. You've seen this before. This is a great representation of a meme made by someone who's in extreme fight or flight. This is radical, right? And it's a radical fight or flight response. The uh, inferred belief is your body image and this look is where your inclusion resides. That's extreme. You might not have noticed that before this class. This is an immediate sign of mental health issues. That's what this is. This is not healthy. This is psychological uh, fight or flight. Promoting an extreme body image as if, if, you, if you don't do it, you gotta wanna do it. You gotta want this. What, who, why would you want this if it requires self-centeredness, the money to get the tan, isolation from reality, increased urges to binge, probably a degree of bulimia, right? And it's unnatural. And then you're gonna promote it, right? So you're promoting this. You're gonna post pictures of it. Another sign that there might be something wrong with your original internal sense of worth. This is not healthy. I would never promote this, especially like this, because they care, right? This is a, the inferred, inferred thing here is she's superior. This is what your goal is. You can have a body that whether it fits it or not, the key is, do you care? Is it really that important to your survival? Is it how you wanna promote your worth, right? So really consider how body image for many of you has been how you've defined a sense of safety within yourself and that how that might over time create potentially a problem. Maybe not as extreme as an eating disorder, but disordered eating. Here is more inferred. Choosing between having food or getting this, which one is it? Which one is it? You remember this whole flip-flop around the hierarchy of needs? This is the perfect example. <laughs> it's either food or hotness, which is really about being included in a superior way. Same shit right here. Same thing. So when you see media like this, I'm hoping that your intellect starts to start. It starts to work rather than just internalized belief and being like, oh, I feel like shit. Look at the little bit of fat on my weight. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I don't look like her. I don't have these freaking quads. That you see this as, oh, survival mechanism, narcissistic body image to supplement low self-worth and a belief that you are unworthy. As if it's healthy, as if this is the great thing to do, right? Disconnect from reality to live in an alternative 
narcissistic ideology that is pretty radical, right? Anorexia. So we're going to kind of start with a little bit here because this is really about that. And then we go into different ones. Characterized by an abnormally low body weight, an intense fear of gaining weight, and a distorted perception of weight. Why do you think it's about weight? Why would someone want to be super ultra lean? Isn't it promoted? Didn't you guys see this last? You saw the last slides. I mean, that's everywhere, right? As if you're worthy. So this, and anorexia is a little different. It is more narcissistic in nature. So when you are in or in, you're in an anorexic state of mind, you believe the leaner you are, the more superior you are, the more successful you are, the more um, in control you are over your own work is everything to do with worthiness. And you're successful at isolation. That's the other thing. When I worked with anorexics, we started successful in their isolation and then they couldn't maintain it because they were going to college because they got pregnant. They start to have more of a binge eating disorder behavior with bulimia because they're failing at it. They cannot isolate from food to maintain their starvation long enough. So they start to interact in reality, can't handle that. And then to maintain their thin supremacy, they will puke it up or exercise it off. So anorexia is the idealism of thinness to the most ultimate degree. Again, this is really extreme, but I don't know if you knew this, but 20% of people with anorexia die. It's got the highest morbidity rate when you add bulimia, because bulimia is extremely dangerous than any other mental illness. So this pursuit of thinness and ideal, whatever you want to call health it is, which is super not healthy, is actually very dangerous, right? There's a high, uh, so unfortunately, a lot of people like to think of it as an eating disorder, when in reality, the eating disorder part of it is actually serving its supply to the ideal body image. But what people see is the disordered eating, right? They don't see the thin supremacy that underlies these specific eating disorders because a lot of people believe in it. They've internalized it. So I can't tell you how many people I've coached who went to a therapist who was basically saying, oh, you won't gain weight. Oh, you won't. No, you're, you're going to always be lean. Don't even worry. They're basically agreeing that being thinner is important without realizing that you just promoted what is underlying the eating disorder. So these are common. I'm not hungry, keep calm, and the hunger will pass. These are, you know, the inspiration. Again, notice that a body image and food connection. And this is real. I don't know, any of you know someone who has been anorexic? I would have thought this was fact to me. This is so or not, because you need to be superior. This is normal, that's bad. There is, no, there is no gray in a mind around that survival need to be superior to be included. And this is a good example here of, where did that come from? Ashamed of weight, why? Where would that be attached to? What hierarchy of need, right? Belonging that your belonging is worthless if your weight isn't correct. You guys can kind of see how these are connected. Orthorexia, I discussed briefly, this is a proposed eating disorder um, that was promoted by Dr. Uh, Bratman. He actually had this issue. Um, he was super, uh, he's an MD, super ultra health zealot around food to the point where he, became isolated and disconnected, super critical, super judgmental of others. Um, it's a, not just a preoccupation with healthy eating. This is, this is not enough. It's actually more than that, right? Um, it's an obsession and it's a narcissistic obsession. So your, your adequacy, your sense of worth comes from being superior in your healthy eating. And so what you'll experience if you're with someone like this is they're going to, you're going to eat that. 
oh my God, that is so unhealthy. I have to tell you about why that is so disgusting and unhealthy. Have you heard about the nitrates? Have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? Oh my God, do you know what it does? There's a, a really kind of fear-based, um, danger-based connection to food, but in a superior self-righteous way. So my health righteousness, I call it health righteousness, which is really common, um, stems from how healthy my food is, right? This is probably the most, uh, I read somewhere, the, the biggest influx of people seeking psychological help have issues with this, that it's become something that is not, they're not functioning well. They're afraid to eat. They won't go out to eat. So they have to carry food with them to go out to eat, which is really disconnecting with other people. So they're basically treating their body as if it's on the verge of dying. And any type of food is going to kill it, right? So you can see that is, again, an extreme version of that. So I wish that they would talk about it differently, that it's just, if you go to Dr. Bratman's website, he goes into great detail around like, yeah, being like wanting to understand nutritional values and the importance of nutritional diversity. It's very different than health righteousness. It usually is moralistic. How dare you eat that way, you piece of shit, right? So you're degrading someone's worth. And that's because that person is projecting their sense of moral, the high ground with food consumption. Again, that air of superiority has a lot to do with how they feel worthy of inclusion. So I've often with clients will say, well, what happens if all of those measures go away? Let's just say you're forced to eat, you're in a, someone's home and there's no way for you to, they feed you. You're in a new country and it's going to be extremely offensive if you don't eat their food. And they literally panic with terror. Oh my God, how do I know? I don't know what's in it. I got to know what's in the food because they're in fight or flight. They're in kind of an extreme level of survival mode with danger in food based on concepts. Again, these are concepts, not facts of health, right? Does that sound healthy to be, to be that preoccupied, disconnected from reality? Probably not. They eventually stop socializing, going out to eat, and oftentimes have new, uh, disease problems because they're not getting enough nutrition. They're relying a lot of times on supplementation, not realizing that it doesn't necessarily absorb properly, especially because they're in chronic fight or flight anyways. And then when they do eat, they have terrible digestive problems. So these are just examples of this industry that is promoting this mindset. This is such a bunch of hooey, like so ridiculous on so many levels. Just so you know, no, no. So I want you to be critical thinking around the message. Immediately this message should be like, oh, okay. Toxic. You see, do you see how they're messaging this? Caution. Like, I can't tell you, you have to have alkaline water, you have to have everything has to be. And again, really what they're saying is your body is is so weak. You are your body is so incapable. That French fries, you know, my favorite food is freaking French fries. Are you kidding me? Now, I would have believed this when I was mentally ill, for sure. I would have been like, oh my God. And then I would have puked it up after I binged it up or exercised for two hours, thinking I was really healthy. Bulimia. Basically, this is anorexia, but you're not functioning well in it. So that you're having a hard time controlling those bio brain impulses to eat, feast before famine, feast after famine, right? But the key is that you're neg you've negotiated, you've negotiated with a way to prevent the weight gain because everything has to do with that thin supremacy or the idea that you're healthy leaner. And so if you overeat, you're going to try to find a way to make it balance, to balance it out. And it, it's not just by puking exercise bulimia is a real thing. I went from puking to exercise bulimia. It was ugh, miserable, just absolutely miserable. 
When I was more of an exercise bulimic, that was when suicidal ideation skyrocketed. You're just a slave. You're a slave to your fear of food. You're a slave to um, being isolated from reality because you can't be in reality because, oh my God, I'm going to binge eat. I can't control myself. And then when you do go out in reality, now you've got to find a way to make up the difference. And so you now have to work out in the middle of the night. I remember going and working out at 11 PM, running around downtown Boise when I was in college, because I had overeaten my dinner and I refused to binge or purge because I didn't want to be bulimic anymore. So I thought I was doing the right thing. I also remember getting up at 3.30 in the morning to over-exercise for at least an hour because I knew I was going to be on a plane flight and wasn't going to get to exercise. So I had to make sure I burned the calories before I started the day. Very unhealthy. Extremely unhealthy. There, this is actually more unhealthy, especially with um, how it affects your um, sodium and potassium when you're puking food up, your teeth erode, your esophagus erodes over time. I puked and I counted the most I puked in one day was 15 times. And each time I don't forget, I binged a massive amount of food. So I would go to the um, gas station that was right on park. Well, it wasn't on park center, but it was on Boise Avenue. And I would buy a bunch of pastries, eat them on my way home. So no one could see it, go home and puke. And then I would do it again because I knew, well, I'm going to go ahead and puke. So I might as well get everything in that I shouldn't be eating. So I'm going to have peanut butter. I'm going to have bowls of cereal. I'm going to go ahead and eat all of this bread. Everything that I was trying to deny myself, I was getting massive amounts in because I knew I was going to be restricting again. And the only reason I was binge eating was because I knew I was going to puke it up. So if I had stopped puking, then I would have had to have faced the underlying shame and trauma that I had experienced because I would have gained weight that would have conflicted with my coping mechanism. And I would have had to face my inadequacy, which is what I ultimately did. So again, you've seen this body image. Once you start, you become addicted. Addicted to what? What are you being addicted to? Clearly, is it body image? How bad do you want it? What are you willing to sacrifice? For what? What are they promoting? It's certainly not health. So this is the mindset of bulimia. This is it. Work it off. That's called exercise bulimia. I have been a personal trainer for over 20 years. And let me tell you, this is not healthy. Food should not be connected to exercise, period. Your physical fitness should have nothing to do with your food consumption unless you need more nutritional value because you're weight training, which ultimately is really specific and selective. You should not be connecting physical fitness with your relationship with food. They should not be connected at all. And if they are problems, that's not good. It's not healthy. You should be doing this because it, it's fun. The music, right? Go to a spinning class, get your heart rate up. Sometimes it's, it's good to get out some of the, um, you're under stress, right? Not to do it because you wanna feel that you uh, are a better person or can handle a challenge, but because you're in fight or flight and you know it. Sometimes it's good to punch a punching bag right? Do the fight, do the fight, but don't do it connected to that. That's now we've got dysfunction in both directions. Uh, bulimia also is abusing diuretics. So the idea is you can just shit everything out, right? And this is promoted all over the place. Quick fat, quick weight loss. So this is actually really common and can create a lot of gastrointestinal problems. So you can kind of see this is promoted as water weight loss, reduced bloating, right? And being ultra lean. So now we're gonna use a diuretic. Remember the bile beans from a hundred years ago? Same shit, a hundred years later. But now it's gonna be more jacked. Again, that leaner idealism. So binge eating disorder is, is when someone has impulsive, uncontrollable bouts of extreme eating rapidly. So it's different than emotional eating. Binge eating is out of control. Uh, and it does feel like 
your food is going to be taken from you. It's a radical terror around food will be gone. Food is going away. And it is starts with the more they study this, the, uh, shame is a trigger. Underlying shame, specifically about their weight. And then there is an immediate urge to binge eat. Why do you think? Well, I'm going to have you guys think for a second. Shame about body fat, extreme shame, maybe self disgust. Why would someone then want to go binge eat? What were that? Why would that be connected? I'm going to let you guys think about it, and hopefully, someone can give a guess. Anybody? Come on, someone give a guess. Why would someone who feels ashamed about their body fat feel an urge to binge eat? You think it has anything to do with believing they should diet? Any connection? Anybody think that? Dieting. The belief that food first of all, that they shouldn't be eating it, that food is going to go away, that this is the last time they're going to eat it, that they're going to start another diet. And a lot of times people with binge eating disorder never really get to the diet. The other thing is over time with binge eating disorder, you can create a codependent relationship with binge eating to handle struggles in reality. So I like to kind of visualize that map of consciousness with binge eating disorder. You're a little bit more in apathy pointlessness. It's hopeless. You still hold the shame. You still feel the stigma. You've self-stigmatized. So they know that for sure. People who are binge, have binge eating disorder have self-stigmatized that they are worthless pieces of shit because they have this body fat that they cannot contain their relationship with food. And then this relationship with food can be used to, to deal with hardship. Um, so when I, the people I've worked with, oftentimes they want to lose weight. They're intending to lose weight. They're binging, thinking they're going to lose the weight. They believe the diet's going to fix it. They truly believe the next diet is going to fix what's happening while they're binge eating in preparation. So they are agreeing to gain weight while they binge, assuming that the next, that they will someday fix it. Someday I'm going to fix this. And nothing ever really does get it fixed, right? Because they've got, they haven't really dealt with their underlying issues, right? And even if let's just say they do something temporarily to fix the body fat issue, they, the fear and anxiety of regaining the weight is so massive that their uh, strictness with dieting becomes even more strict. So then they become more prone to failure and then binge eating. So it's a terrible cycle. So in this case, oftentimes this flips, right? So where your physiological needs become more important in the moment than inclusion, because you feel so much shame about this that you might as well give yourself what you're been deprived of or what you anticipate deprivation of. So it's a real compensatory um, kind of magnification of these needs because you feel that this is worthless beyond repair. That's a, a theory out there too, evolutionary wise, is that binge eating might be a compensation for feeling worthy of abandonment, exclusion, right? Being shunned into the wilderness. That what this does is it increases the need for your bio, biological needs. So this is where people might become obsessed with cleanliness, they might become addicted to sex. They might become, they have a lot of different things to try to compensate for what they feel inadequate on the inside as a human being. Uh, there are so much. I wrote an entire book about this. So I pared it down to one slide, but this is just an example of 2,449 2, women who were asked, they were surveyed, how they cope with fat shaming experiences, fat stigma, especially in the medical community. And there's so much data and statistics about stigma and obesity in the medical community. What do you guys think? 79% reported eating, turning to food as a coping mechanism. 
So is this third hierarchy of need is verifiably not doing well, the value of food skyrockets, especially if they believe they need to lose weight, they need to go on a diet. Feasting before famine is the first thing that happens. As shame increases, the urge to binge increases, it's zeroized that when at risk for abandonment and rejection, the value of securing the environmental and physiological needs skyrocket because you're gonna have to protect yourself, right? So here is an example of just inherent shaming. This was actually sold at Macy's. So if you wanna wear your skinny jeans, make sure you eat this much. If you want to wear your favorite jeans, but if you wanna wear mom jeans, you fat piece of mom suck, eat that much on the hips. So shaming, right? What does this have to do with your biological need for food when we talk about leptin? In fact, if someone is wearing their skinny jeans, where is their hunger? <laughs> Just think about leptin and what we've learned about leptin with ultra lean individuals. If you're wearing your hot skinny jeans, where's your hunger level? What do you think? You two are laughing at the storm over here. No. I know it's not about this because it's a serious topic. I know you guys need to know this because you're gonna have a quiz. What happens? It's fine. Yeah, you're hungry. You're leaner. Less fat, more hunger, depending on your state of stress, right? Because stress can reduce all that hunger. But leaner typically equates to hungrier more often, more food that it takes to reduce that hunger. And they're going to suggest that you remain ultra, eat less to maintain. Why? Why would this be promoted? What has been internalized in the community around a women's worth? Go back to those old ads. Same shit, new century. Hey, this is a great example of, it's your choice if you want to eat <laughs> or be seen as superior, ultra lean, right? It's your choice. Here's another one. But this is, this is actually a reality. I like these because this is really true. People that uh, believe in kind of like diet dogma, will have see this pizza pizza and be like, oh my God, that's so bad for you. Oh my God, there's so much badness in this, right? So they might eat it anyways, but they're mostly experiencing shame. So you remember what I said about shame and it's triggered a fight or flight? It's a big one. So they're biologically stimulating far more inflammatory markers than the person who doesn't give a shit about the pizza because of the shame attached to it, that they've done wrong, worthy of exclusion and abandonment. Fear and anger are by far the most inflammatory emotions that we experience. That's fight, flight, right? And shame is an extreme fear of abandonment. And why would someone eat feeling guilty? Why is food bad, moral, right? Again, guilt, Guilt is like an admission of like badness, fault. I've done, I've done wrong. It's a little crazy, if you ask me. I remember thinking, um, I just want to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich like I did as a child. That's, I, just, I just wanted to be able to eat like a normal person again without feeling like the world was collapsing in on itself. But because the fat, it was, you know, had too many, you know, nuts, goo, might have too much starch, and then there's all the fat, and then there's like sodium, and then, oh my God, the gluten, and let's not forget, can't have peanut butter or jelly. Jeez, that's sugar. Are you kidding me? So bad for you. And the bread is basically sugar anyways. I mean, that, right? Super not healthy. That's not healthy thinking. Where did I learn all that? From freaking memes and shit. From some health health uh, community that promotes shit like this. This is just so dumb. Really? So we're gonna make sure you don't eat, just have a shake. We're gonna just just have a shake. So we're not gonna have you eat food, which should be all of this combined, right? All of this. So we're inferring that this person just eats total shit, which is so ignorant, right? And that this person is basically only eating vegetables and fruit, which is anorexic uh, messaging, by the way. But we're not going to even do that. You're just going to shake. Just going to shake. Right. So how is that affecting 
that psychology of food that we talked about around, is it available? Can I get more? Is it enough? Is it safe to eat? Is it pleasurable? Which one is being triggered here? Which one of those five? All of them. And on top of that, it's just, it's, it's just, you're not considering the psychology of someone who thinks this way that actually promotes that. So thinking this way promotes this, not necessarily the food, but it does because you're going to be binge eating on what you shouldn't be eating because that's what's going to be scarce. So this, this actually is a promotion of a problem. This ad, it's not healthy. Same with this one, inferring it's your choice. Can this person even go out? <laughs> I think it's vegetarian or veganism. Oh. It doesn't matter to me what it is, if it's moralistic and body shaming. And um, this is just terrible messaging. It's just wrong. Do you know how many people I've met that look like this who are obsessed with diets, who have studied, who have devoted hours, so much money wanting to figure it out? Obsessed. And this is inferring that this person doesn't know. And then not only that, but I, get, I would argue that mu much of this in here, besides the sweets and novelty foods, People would flip this around and say, she, all she needs is meat and fish, you know? So it just depends on whose mental illness you want to internalize around an eating disorder. So let's go into the binge cycle because I want you to understand how this actually works. So it obviously starts with number one here. Weak sense of self, that's where it starts, period. <laughs> that's where it started for me. That's where it starts for every single person I work with. They wouldn't have a body image shame if they didn't internalize some superior body image to, to chase after to feel better about themselves, right? So weak sense of self, strong sense of inadequacy. They observe praise in the community. So there is this, oh, look, they're being praised because they're healthier, fitter. Like, oh my God, I want to be like that. I want to be seen as valuable. I want to be seen as worthy. You compare yourself to those images, right? That results in positive or negative body image. For someone who doesn't internalize body image, they don't, they feel neutrality about their body, way more neutral. Um, so it's specifically, you, you can still have a problem. Let's just say you're a religious zealot. You may be, you may not have these issues because you're fixated on kind of your supremacy with your belief system. Right. So you might not have this issue, but you have it in somewhere else. Right. But with this case, this is for people who specifically are using body image, whether it's health image, sexual attractiveness image, whatever it is, to compensate for feelings of inadequacy. You compare yourself to that image, it doesn't fit, or it does fit. So that's where positive body images, like, hey, I feel good about myself because I look like the images that are promoted. So you're basically feeling positive about your assimilation. That's what that is. I'm assimilating and I'm assimilating in a superior way. Therefore I feel safe. That's what attraction is, right? Increased urge to fixate or use uh, if you have negative body image. So a positive body image, you're gonna want to keep what you have. If you have negative body image, you're gonna wanna get what you don't have, right? Then you begin to study solutions and reinforcement. So I'm going to study what's right and wrong with bad food, right? And this is where the person who is obese typically is an expert in nutrition and weight loss. Because um, they're studied with, they're obsessing with their survival to understand it. You actively restrict your food. Boom, boom, boom. Now we're in the restriction phase. You're trying to eliminate and focus to uh, separate, this is what I can eat, this is what I should be eating, this is what I can't eat, these are not good, remove it from option, right? The, un the unfortunate thing here is as this is occurring, as the mind starts to hone in focus, so imagine you've got a, it's, it's like a microscope in your brain, 
that microscopically fixates on food. That's what it feels like. Focus, hyper focus. It's like everything else becomes like, uh, and this is what it feels like with an eating disorder. It feels like everything else is fuzzy and not important because you're trying to control the food. And the illusion is, is that if I can control this food, then everything is gonna be clear to me, that I won't have to worry about food because I have it in control, right? And so that doesn't happen really until you start actively dieting, reinforcing the diet. And then your increase, so if you're more around food, if everybody in the world was in famine, you wouldn't have a problem, right? And you wouldn't have an eating disorder and this wouldn't be an issue because everybody's thin and you wouldn't think the superior, all the things. But if you're around reality and you can't isolate because you have a job, because you have family, because you have school, you have other things that need to be done because you want to go out and participate in your community, you're going to have to deal with that intense survival urge to get food, to have enough food, make sure you have more <laughs> and you're going to eat it. Right. And then when you do, you lose control. Right. And oftentimes that loss of control comes with negotiations. So and now we're on five. You're not going to negotiate because you're negotiating with your diet rules. Well, how am I going to get the food that I am like my brain is fixating on when my rules clearly say that's an affront of fat? You're going to negotiate. Well, I'm really stressed out. Well, I've really done a good job. I've already lost a few pounds. So you're going to start negotiating, right? With your diet rules. And you'll say, and this is the key to a binge. It requires that you agree to dieting beforehand. If you, you will say, I will fix this later, I promise. Then the gate to that table of abundance opens. You can go have what you want without shame and guilt. When you remove the shame and guilt from food, it is euphoric. I cannot tell you how euphoric it is. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Because there's no shame and guilt in that moment. You don't have to feel bad anymore. It's removing that feeling of badness for two seconds with that's been attached to food. It's an incredible feeling. I remember when I recovered having to grieve that euphoria that I would much rather have neutrality with food than this extreme kind of good cop, bad cop relationship with it that I would, would rather die to deal with. So when you remove the shame and guilt because you've got appropriate negotiations and you pre-committed to go back on the diet, it's very euphoric, especially for that period of time. That doesn't mean you don't feel shame afterwards because you do. You're like, why couldn't I control myself? Why couldn't I manage this? Well, it's because your primal brain took over and you're going to lose. This new diet concept isn't going to, isn't going to override hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. It's just not right. So then you bargain with a future diet, then you start to binge or emotionally eat. And then the guilt and shame about not having willpower increases. And then you start over, this triggers this, and this is how it works. So usually a binge is sandwiched between two diets. You either are gonna diet, you failed the diet, you binge, but you know you're gonna diet. So usually a binge requires two diets. So when you see someone, when I see someone who is, would be considered medically morbidly obese, you know what I think? Do, I, do you think I, I go back to this picture? Is that really what's going on? Because chances are, and this person's actually not morbidly obese at all. It's pretty healthy. I don't know which that one. This person feels bad about their body and they're binge eating, thinking they're going to fix it. And they binge ate before they dieted, and then they binge ate after they dieted, and then again. So, what they found with dieters generally, they binge eat more so than people who just don't, don't diet at all period. So when you see someone that's larger like this, the first thing I think is that person has negative body image and they probably believe that they are unworthy. So this was hilarious. I think this is really funny. Take the time because this is a reality because I've been around uh, 25 years since I've recovered from my eating disorder. And I've been in this industry in not just the medical weight loss industry, but the fitness industry. And this is freaking fact. This is a fact, how this works. And this is really kind of funny. Can you guys read it? 
Hey. So this basically is someone who has got lots of followers that's like, oh my God, I've uncovered uncovered the secret to health. And he probably has orthorexia. Um, so this new diet, we're gonna you only eat during the waxing crescent mood and only eat foods that are your blood type, period. And then you hashtag it. Someone who's got lots of followers says, oh my God, we're going to have weight loss. Stop that, Jamie. This is super freaking funny. You guys pull this up on your computer when you have time, because this is so good. And then you have Gwyneth Paltrow announces that she's on the diet. And then you have inconclusive preliminary semi-related theoretical research on yeast that's proven beyond a doubt that this, di this diet is effective for humans. That is freaking hilarious if you know anything about research which means that there's really no anything to this. And then this person goes, well, that guy's a researcher, therefore I'm gonna support it because I'm gonna get paid to promote it. And then you have the followers. I've recovered my, <laughs> okay, can you guys see that? I've re reconnected with my kids since going on a diet. If that's not proof, I don't know what is. And then over here, joining me this week is Luke who abandoned his children before discovering an extraordinary, this is a thing. People think that you will never fart again if you go on a certain diet. Like, oh my God, my digestion is working. Oh, I must have eaten too much gluten. Seriously, this is a thing. People, and then um, then it finds out that it doesn't really work and my binge eating disorder is disconnected. And, um, and then it happens again. I've uncovered the next, and this is the same guy, but he shaved his face. Same shit, another story. This has been going on since we were giving people tapeworms. Don't forget the shaking machines. Remember the tapeworms, right? <laughs> yeah, this has been going on over and over and over and over again. Keep in mind, fight or flight is the biggest trigger to inflammation when it comes to the central nervous system. Anger, fear. Now connect fear to food. Connect fear to food and then eat it. Tell me how that's gonna digest. Connect some religious food moralism to connect that, connect religious moralism to food. And then tell me how the body of that person is going to react when they eat it. It's going to be kind of extreme and even more extreme if they've isolated and removed it from their diet, right? Just like someone who doesn't eat meat, if they go and eat meat, they're going to have a problem. But then add shame to that. That's even worse biologically to digestion and inflammation. But yeah, this has been going on since, I mean, forever, at least in the thin supremacy world. So if we go into some statistics around eating disorders, only 10% of people with eating disorders will receive, treat, receive treatment. I can attest to this because I didn't think I had a problem. I thought I was healthy until I realized I, I couldn't control any of it. And I completely isolated and was lying about it. 35% seek treatment from a facility that specializes in eating disorders. And even then, it's very difficult because you're dealing with survival and how someone is clutching to life and removing terror. 42% of first, third grade girls want to be thinner. Why do you think that they've been exposed to? We're talking six, seven, and eight year olds. Why would 42% of six, seven, and eight year old girls want to be thinner? What is it that they've already started seeing repeated and hearing at home, this is a big deal. Your food is unhealthy, you shouldn't be eating this. It's bad. Um, I need to lose weight, right? So often, so often the clients I worked with had parents who didn't necessarily shame the child. That does happen, like you're overweight, you piece of shit, you can't have the cupcake um, for your birthday. That happens. But more often than not, the mother shames herself and the child listens to it and says, oh my God, I don't want to be, I don't want to be that. That's because the mom and the dad are treating themselves, teaching the child how to treat themselves. It's not necessarily my parents treated me poorly. It's my parents treated themselves poorly. And that's modeling how I should treat myself. 91% of women surveyed on college campuses had uh, attempted to control their weight through dieting. Of course because that's how you do it. Chances are there is emotional eating for 91% of those people. I mean, really think about it. Chances are there's emotional eating and there's a high potential level of 
disordered eating, which isn't an eating disorder. Disordered eating is when it's more pronounced, but you can still hold a job. You can still have relationships. Once it becomes a diagnosable disorder, it's very difficult to hold relationships, a job or function. I had to quit college. I had to give up a full ride scholarship. I couldn't function anymore. I had an eating disorder. But prior to that, I just was disordered eating, I was binging and over exercising, right? Um, and 22% diet always or often. They're more likely to have maybe disordered eating. So what's the difference between disordered eating and eating disorder? Thank you for asking. Um, an eating disorder is, I just went over that. I'm gonna, so you can re-listen to this, but an eating disorder is when you can't function well. You can't work. Um, like I had an eating disorder. I had to quit college. I had to, I had to give up a full ride scholarship because I wasn't eating. I was so obsessed with dieting and exercise that I, I lost muscle. I couldn't jump anymore. I couldn't go to classes anymore. I wasn't functioning well. I was so obsessed. Where disordered eating, you can still function. Doesn't mean you're not depressed, anxious, and miserable. It's just, you're functioning. You're still functioning. And it's a precursor to an eating disorder. So people don't just get an eating disorder. They usually end up with disordered eating first. So that would be, for example, I'm going to diet all week. I'm starting on Monday. You do well on Monday. By Tuesday, you're like, I'm feeling so good. You're measuring your waist. By the weekend, you're like, screw this shit. I want to party. I'm bin and then you binge all weekend thinking I'll fix it again on Monday. But you do feel bad about it. And that can happen on a daily basis too. Um, but it's it's usually not so bad that you can't function, right? It still is horrible and it still is a big problem. Um, one out of 10 people with an eating disorder is male. I think when it's binge eating disorder, one male to two females. So it's much higher. Five to 10% of anorexics die within 10 years. 18 to 20% die within 20 years. 50% report never being cured. So how do you heal from this? Disassociating one's worth from superior body image. This is really important. I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna gotta go through this quickly. Strengthening a sense of self that is real and authentic. The only way for this to happen is for someone to separate themselves from the body image. So one of the things that I have clients do is visualize their life being morbidly obese forever. And they usually feel immediate relief because then they would just, they wouldn't be held to it so intensely. Um, anorexics feel very different. They'd rather murder themselves and die because to them being inferior is the worst. So they can't imagine their superiority. Um, and you need to validate yourself based on your true authentic worth. So when I work with someone, let's just say someone does 400 pounds when come to the medical clinic, the first thing we would want to do is address their body image problems. A lot of people would come in and be like, I need to fix my marriage. Just put that together. Hold on, you're gonna diet to fix your marriage. This is a terrible catastrophe that's about to happen. Right, because this is, shouldn't be about your marriage. Your marriage should be about how you relate to your spouse and your spouse shouldn't want you to be miserable. I don't know, it's, it's really deep, but you wanna make sure that someone's sense of worth isn't attached to their body, right? And if a spouse doesn't want you because of your body, it's probably not gonna work out anyways. They should go find someone else who has a body. Except you'll never be thinner. This is actually, I need you to think through this because this was what, this is how you get people to recover and they go through it and they have to be like, yeah, I'd rather never be thinner. I'd rather accept my body as it is. That means if you're morbidly obese, that if you accept your body the way it is, you might have some type of ailment. If they can do that, what happens is the shame goes away. The impulse to diet goes away and their binge eating immediately stops. Accepting you'll gain more weight. This is typically an anorexic or bulimic. That's where we start them. You might gain weight. What would that be like? Go through it. Who are you if you're bigger? So what you're trying to get them to do is, again, disassociate their worth from the state of the body, whether it's thinner or fatter or anything in between. Um, it's a non-attachment. Except that if you lose weight, you could regain it. So the key is also not attaching to any form of weight loss in a narcissistic or superior way. Okay. 
I will finish this on Wednesday. Okay, so really quick, the homework. Let's go to the end of this because I wanna make sure, because you guys can start this now. Five days, um, homework. This There's a daily log. This is a single day. So what I posted in the homework is one single day. You're gonna wanna print this out five times. So don't just fill out one of these and think that you're done. You need to do this for five days. The goal is that you are listening to hunger, recognizing when you get hungry. So I would write down when you wake up and then see how long it takes to get hungry. And that's the first one. What time, what time you woke up, jot it on the side. When you ate a uh, small, uh, what you ate, like I had toast with butter. You don't need to be, unless you want to do all the calculations, you can do more, but I don't care. And then what were you be hunger before and after using this hunger scale? And I also posted the hunger scale on the homework. So the goal here is to differentiate if you have any emotional desires to eat. Do you have any survival impulse to eat? Well, in comparison to like a biophysical urge to eat based on true hunger and to understand and know what they're coming from. So five days may or may not be enough. You can do more if you want, but five days is what's due. I should get five of these returned in. We'll talk more about it on Wednesday. Okay, goodbye.